we are here today to talk about, well, I'm here today to talk to you about autism and the tech sector. Why should you guys care? So first of all, thank you for coming along. Um, that already shows that you do care a bit about learning about this area. Um, so firstly, thank you for coming along. Um, secondly, it's amazing that, um, you know, really great to see that there's internet people, you know, internationally from across the world uh, joining this meeting. Um, yeah, that'll be my first time doing a kind of international speaking gig in that way. So hello to people across the world and outside the UK. Um, so yes, as Kim was saying, my name is Nelly. Um, and I'm going to be doing this talk for you today. So a little bit of an overview, just to give you an idea of what to expect. So for the first uh, 45 minutes, uh, I'm gonna be looking at various different topics, including introducing me, uh, thinking about what autism actually is and what it means to be autistic, as well as why should you learn about autism that's particularly in the context of the tech sector. Then looking specifically at working in tech, thinking about reasonable adjustments, and then finally looking a bit at support as well. And hopefully there'll be about five to 10 minutes at the end for a bit of questions and discussion. And feel free to use the chat for that purpose. Um, I probably won't look at the chat too frequently in the actual session. Um, so if you could hold uh, questions till the end, or pop them in the chat as a piece and you come back to this later, then I will try to do that. And also a little bit of a content note there that I will briefly mention some kind of mental health uh, problems, nothing, nothing too intense. Um, but if you do have any concerns, then please do contact Kim uh, again on those emails that she mentioned, or of course you can uh, drop her a message. Um, so yes, with that, we will get into the kind of meat of the presentation. So, hello. Essentially, uh, I am a COBAR student and actually the past session I went to, um, I became a bit of a coach as well uh, because we had a lot of students and not as many coaches. So um, that was good. So I've kind of dipped my feet into coaching a little tiny, tiny bit as well. Um, but I've been with COBAR um, technically just over a year as a student, but my first uh, workshop that I went to in person was in June last year. So it's coming up to my year anniversary of going along to workshops. And I go to uh, the workshops in Norwich. And this is a picture from uh, the Norwich chapters Instagram um, of me and one of my coaches, the lovely Alex, who, um, yeah, is really great. Shout out to him. Um, and yeah, I've, I had a really great experience of going along to Code Bar and I wanted to give back in this talk. And also I think I, as with a lot of the tech sector, I think there's lots of lovely, amazing people and you all have so many great skills and talents and you know about so many different areas. But with autism, it's like, well, maybe some people aren't quite aware of it and maybe some people aren't sure how to approach it or might find it a bit kind of scary. Like, oh, I don't know, am I gonna, Say the wrong thing and so I think with COBAR and with the tech sector kind of I guess globally um, I want to encourage people to think about autism and learn a bit about it and not be afraid to talk about it and to uh, yeah support their autistic colleagues and to also support themselves and to work out how to um, yeah best live a good life as an autistic person if you are yourself autistic. Um, so yeah, huge shout out to Cobar Norwich because uh, that's where my journey with Cobar started. So as I mentioned, I am autistic. I was diagnosed in 2020 via a number of video calls. Um, that was when I was 25, I'm 28 now. Um, so that is quite late for someone to be diagnosed as autistic. However, it's not the latest you can be diagnosed, you know, you can be diagnosed when you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s when you're 100, you know, it, it, there's no cutoff but as to when you can be diagnosed as being autistic. Um, I worked for the National Autistic Society, which um, for those of you who don't know, is one of the UK's leading autism charities. Um, and I worked there from 2019 through to kind of mid to late last year. Um, and then after that, I made the big switch into the tech sector. 
So I left my job within the third sector and I managed to graduate from two boot camps local to me. One of them was only a week, you know, like I didn't do like two 10 week boot camps or anything, but overall it was 12 weeks of learning. Um, actually, sorry, I tell a lie. It was, I think it was two weeks, the, uh, the other one. Anyway, a good number of weeks studying and getting to know some really great people um, through boot camps with a brilliant um, organization called Tech Educators. Um, and those were mainly in person. So that's something I think I'll start off with in that I'm an autistic person and there might be a stereotype that you know of that autistic people, people might think, oh, autistic people, we like to stay in our rooms all the time and we don't like to go out and socialize and we don't like to be in person, we'd rather work from home. And actually I found that going in person after having worked from home for a long time, I'd actually worked from home since 2019, uh, so pre-pandemic, um, I actually found going in person was crucial to my well-being um, and was really, really valuable to me. Um, and I also found through doing those boot camps that it, it they matched my brain to an extent don't get me wrong there were certainly elements that I didn't understand and tried to work to understand but I like black and white concepts I like when things when you change one small thing and then bam like red light to green light it like it suddenly works and then like your sight comes up and you're like oh this is this is great so I like that aspect and I also am a creative person so those two combined really that it helped that I like those two areas in terms of going into coding, in terms of going into uh, web development. Um, coupled with, I also do quite like crochet, which I think there's kind of similarities between the two, crochet and code. Um, and I now work as a trainer and expert by lived experience uh, in the tech sector and beyond that. So I work with the NHS as well. Um, and essentially that is my day job. So I deliver training and I also do some kind of I'm starting to do a bit of consultancy work as well um, and so yeah my career has kind of been a winding path that has taken me to where I am today and then yeah that's a little picture of me uh, on the NES Twitter account uh, when I wrote a little thing for them back when I worked there so that's a bit about me but what you're here to learn about is autism from an autistic person. Um, so why should you learn about autism? Well, my former employer, you know, I'm not, not biased, but they are, I mean, I am, I am biased. They're, um, they are a genuinely a really good source of information online. Um, and I was thinking about this today as well. I, it, it, it dawned on me that I was going to be delivering a talk that was not just to a UK audience. So I will say that they, the information there is really, really good. And some of it will be UK specific. Some of it will be specific down to like England, for example. Um, but I would still recommend it for people um, living internationally to the UK because um, a lot of the information on there still will be valid. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a retrust website. Also the NHS site as well. Um, the pages on there around autism are really, really good. But my former employer, the NAS, they suggest that at least one in 100 people are autistic. That's at least. So people may live and die and never be diagnosed as autistic, but will be autistic. So the example that I always seem to use is um, back, way, way back, hundreds of years ago, the witch trials, the women that were kind of, you know, were accused of being witches, they might have been autistic. Looking back, you know, they were outcasts. Oh, you know, it, that, that's not great. So throughout history, there were probably autistic people, autistic women, autistic men, and autistic people in general. So, and we don't always get diagnosed. So that stat is at least. So, Based on, so I got stats for 2022 of like UK population. Based on that, in 2022, that would have been at least 676,000 people in the UK alone. And that would fill nearly 34 full, um, 
O2 arenas. So that gives you a bit of a context as to how many autistic people there are. And that's at least, so there's lots of us, not to scare you, we're fine, we're very friendly, um, but yeah, there are lots of autistic people in the UK and you will know someone who was autistic or at least will have met someone if you don't know someone really, really well. Um, and you've met me today, so there you go. Secondly, tech, okay? So I think going into the sector, I probably had that assumption that there were going to be some neurodivergent people and I've definitely come across neurodivergent people in tech, but this really backs it up for me. So um, this information is from an organization called the Tech Talent Charter and they produced um, a report called the Diversity in Tech Report 2024. They based this report on uh, working with signatory organizations, so organizations that are involved with them um, and that have signed up to provide them with data um, and to work with them. Those organizations, they're not small fry, they're the likes of Microsoft, Sky, HP, some big, big names. Um, and basically that tech talent charter group they do a lot around diversity, equality, and inclusion in the tech sector. Um, and so they conducted some research um, and they got some information from their signatories, their signatory organizations, so the likes of Microsoft and Sky. Separate to that, they also did a kind of mini, mini bit of research. I say mini, it was 500 people, but uh, they had a represented sample of 500 UK tech workers and they compared their information. So they found that in that smaller sample of 500 UK tech workers, it didn't say wh where those workers came from. So they could have come from anywhere in terms of uh, the UK tech scene. In that sample, when asked directly, 53% of them identified as neurodivergent. That's over half, that's over 250 people. And when I say neurodivergent, what I mean by that is uh, in the world, everyone is neurodiverse. If you take my um, when you take the whole world, it's neurodiverse. All the brains in it, they're all neurodiverse, they're all different. Then you have neurodivergent brains. Those are brains that differ from the perceived norm, the perceived kind of way that we, that kind of textbooks are like, oh, this is kind of the human brain and this is how people act. We diverge off of that. Um, and so within that category, neurodivergent, you've got autistic people, people have, who have dyslexia, people who have ADHD, uh, dyscalculia, um, dyspraxia, Tourette's, the list goes on, there's a huge, um, variety of conditions within that. So this sample, 53% of them identified as being neurodivergent. And within that, 15% of them identified as being autistic. So that's, that's, a, that's a large amount, okay? So compare that to the information they got from the likes of Microsoft, Sky, HP, and also those exact companies gave this information, but you know, thinking about those big companies, those employers, they reported that 3% of their tech employees are neurodivergent, which is odd. And it could suggest a number of things. One, it could suggest that perhaps employees don't feel safe or don't feel comfortable or undisclosing, and they might not feel they need to disclose that they're autistic or neurodivergent, and that's fine. Two, it might suggest that the employers themselves are thinking, oh, well, we know of the employees who have set reasonable adjustments in place or they have um, access to work set up, which is um, a UK government uh, scheme which provides support to disabled people and people with long term health conditions uh, in work. So they might have on their books kind of these people and they might say, oh, well, it's three percent but they're not taking into account all the other employees who are sitting at their desks and maybe know they're autistic or think they're autistic or know they have dyslexia, but they're thinking either I don't want to or, or I, I won't because of fear of repercussions, fear of maybe how people will treat me in the workplace. 
um, and, and they don't disclose. So why is there that perhaps fear around disclosure? Why is there that perhaps confusion by employers? It's an area that needs looking at. And I think it's an area in the tech sector that you're starting to see more and more people talking about. Secondly, autistic brains can be quite matched to the tech sector. And you'll probably have heard this. Not all brains though, not all autistic brains. Some autistic people will have amazing skills in some areas and some of us will just be kind of, in a really good way, quite average. I would say I'm quite average. Like I'm, I'm, I'm okay at some things, but you know, I'm not some kind of mastermind in one particular area and that's okay. Um, but this was, uh, this kind of whole slide basically is based on a report from Sparta Global which um, they're basically, they kind of work with people, they train them up and then companies hire them. Um, they seem like quite a good company. Um, I'm, I'm not affiliated to any of these companies that I'm mentioning in this presentation, uh, but they produced a report called the Equal Tech Report uh, back in 2023. And within that, they discussed how autistic people working in digital roles are achieving exceptional results in areas such as machine learning and quantum computing, where computational thinking skills are highly sought after. So our brains might work in a certain way that is really going to fit and really going to gel in a tech environment. Not to mention that we might also question how things are, gonna, are done. So we might go into a new workplace and we might seem quite rude or we might seem quite intense because we might go in and go, Oh, why are you using GitHub? Why are you not using Bitbucket? Oh, why are you doing this? Why is your workflow like that? And 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 the new the employees working with that person might think, God, why are they questioning this? But they might have really good ideas. We just might come at it in a way that other people might not expect us to. And so you can imagine that could also potentially cause some workplace conflicts, uh, which is obviously not ideal. But that's potentially because of a lack of understanding around autism and around how we might communicate. And we too might have a lack of understanding around how um, how communications normally go in a new workplace, you know, when you're starting a new job. We might also be really imaginative in terms of our thinking, that kind of idea of like thinking outside of the box, which is, that's a metaphorical term. And uh, sometimes those can be quite hard to understand. I've used that in that instance, but to give you an idea of, you know, we might think differently. Um, but yeah, something to bear in mind that actually some autistic people might struggle with those kind of metaphorical kind of sayings. Innovation, like I said, with the kind of questioning how things are done, we might come in and go, why are you doing that? And then we can bring about change. Focus, we can go into um, really deep states of focus and kind of flow where we're sitting there and we go, oh, I haven't eaten dinner and it's like 9 p.m. or you sit in there and you're like, oh, I actually haven't, I haven't gone to the toilet in like hours. I haven't drunk enough water. We can really just be zoned in. And you can imagine that's quite good for code because you can just sit there for hours and hours if you're really into it. Um, and we can also form connections between things. So for example, we might have really excellent memory and we might say, oh, back in June, 2018, our company had this problem. Um, that's similar to what we're facing now. And the people around them might be like, well, how on earth did you remember that? And then you might be like, oh, because this similar thing happened and I remember it because of this world event and this, this and this. And we can bring about uh, kind of good change uh, through making connections based on the past. So our brains can be quite matched to tech environment. Not all autistic brains, but some. So with that in mind, you can hopefully see that there are going to be autistic people in the tech sector. In fact, there are. They definitely are. And so as people either entering the tech sector or considering entering the tech sector or already in it, in terms of, you know, COBAR students, COBAR coaches, it's important, I think, for you guys to have an understanding around how autistic people are, how they might present in the workplace, how they might present as a fellow student how they might present as your coach at Cobar, because we will be in all different kinds of roles. And like I mentioned with those earlier examples, we might come across as quite brash or quite rude, or maybe the opposite, quite quiet and silent. 
and or maybe a bit confusing a bit like well, what are they doing why are they doing this um and so hopefully by the end of this presentation when you've learned a little bit more kind of about what autism exactly is um you'll come away with the empathy and the understanding to to support those people or just to listen to those people and just to accept them slash us for who we are um so yeah once again thank you for for attending this session so what exactly does it mean to be autistic? Well, again, my former employer uh, describes autism as a lifelong developmental disability, which affects how people communicate and interact with the world. And I will also say here that some of the pictures, I mean, you can see I've used Unsplash, which I do like using, but some of the pictures are from um, this thing called Hickey app, which I only discovered, or Hikey app, which I only discovered through uh, getting pictures for um, presentation slides and uh, yeah I believe the people in those particular pictures are um, autistic themselves and they're really representative so I just wanted to give uh, that a shout out but going back to the definition it is defined as disability um, that does mean that we are you know we can ask for reasonable adjustments which is something I'll come on to later in um, this presentation it's some people might see that we are disabled by society in the sense that, um, you know, maybe if there was a world that was built specifically for autistic people, then we wouldn't feel that we were disabled. Um, but nevertheless, it is, it is um, you know, it, it's defined at least by the National Autistic Society as a disability um, and it affects how we communicate and interact with the world. But it is actually so much more than that just one quote. So we might have difficulties in social interaction and social communication. What does that mean? So as an example, if we're thinking about workplaces again, and even, you know, like virtual classrooms, like your Google Meet that you're on for your, for your boot camp or um, your workshop, the co-bar that you go along to in person or online, one example is we might struggle to know how to code switch. So, um, and I, I also really like this area because I did linguistics as a degree. So I really like language, but code switching is basically when you change your kind of register and the words you use and your kind of tone of voice, depending on the situation. So um, I'll hold my hand up and say that when I deliver presentations, I do have a particular way of talking that is different to how I talk to, say, my mom, which I think is going to be, you know, the same for most people who are like public speakers and trainers. We are going to switch our voice about and, and everyone does. You know, you have like a telephone voice or you have um, a voice that you talk to your dog in. You know, you, you switch it up, you code switch. But say we come in as an autistic person, say we come in on the first day of a boot camp. And maybe we come in and our tone of voice is very formal, like hyper formal, like we're in a job interview, but it's a very formal job interview. And we are being very careful of our words and we're just talking in a very formal way that perhaps stands out in like a Google meet in, in, a, in a video call. We might not have picked up that in that situation, people speak in a way that perhaps isn't as formal. We're perhaps working things out because on that first day of a boot camp, do we know how to how to interact? Do we know how what what the vibe is? Is it formal? Is it informal? We don't quite know. Uh, so we might struggle with that. Equally, we might also struggle with things like uh, recognizing what kind of body language signals mean. So, say we're in a job and we've got someone kind of with their arms crossed behind us, kind of tapping their foot, and they've said to us like. Um, They've, maybe they've said earlier to me, say it's me, for example, maybe they've said like, um, you send that email to me right now. So like, maybe that was five minutes ago. And then they come up behind me in a physical workplace and they've got their like arms crossed and they're, they're tapping their foot and you can hear the foot tapping. But maybe I'm just like, oh, why are they making a, that noise behind me? It's kind of annoying. And we perhaps don't quite pick up on that's because they're impatient. That's demonstrating that they're impatient, that they really want us to do this task. Um, it's quite a it's quite a blunt example that, but it gives an idea of we're not necessarily going to pick up on certain cues, or like if someone rolls their eyes, or you know the more subtle things 
we might not pick up on as to what they mean in a social context um because there aren't it's not written down there aren't written down rules it's not black and white as to this equals this this equals this we're not given a handbook so we kind of just have to feel it out which is quite hard um we might also have quite restricted and repetitive behaviors and i put that in air quotes because it can sound quite negative but that can be a positive thing in that if we're quite restricted in terms of what we um focus on and what we enjoy doing, we can then really excel in that area. Or equally, we don't have to excel in it, we can just get really emerged in it, uh, I mean, immersed in it. So say we really like watching the Harry Potter films, which um, you know, are very old now, but say, say we do really like watching those, that can bring us so much joy and we can really go into a flow and block out the outside world, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. Um, so they can bring us a lot of joy having those really restricted and repetitive things that we do. Um, equally, they can also mean that they um, might mean that we struggle in other areas. So say, for example, we were really um, kind of focused on watching the Harry Potter films. Uh, maybe that then means that we end up cancelling kind of social engagements because we want to watch all of the films in one evening on a particular date when a particular film was released. And so that then might make us feel isolated because we cancelled going to a social occasion. So sometimes it can be negative. Sometimes that area can be positive as well. We might also experience things like sensory sensitivity, which I think at this point probably a lot of people have heard of when it comes to autism. But essentially it's things like being quite sensitive to sound or to light. So it might be, so I've got my noise cancelling headphones. I'm using these for the purposes of, you know, having good audio um, and things for the call. But in day to day life, I will also use these on trains. And sometimes I will just wear them turned off, like not with the, any sound kind of coming through. Just because I quite like the kind of sensory, having something over my ears, kind of like my own little bubble. Um, so we'll have sensitivities and sometimes so our sensitivities to sensory stimuli in the world and that can include things like taste as well so we might be quite picky eaters or picky eaters um we might have a kind of beige food kind of diet because those foods are reliable we know what they're going to taste like unless someone burns them of course in which case you know they're going to count sensory things so we might really like um having something to fidget with for example so i've got a little fidget here we might really like having the tactile sensation of, of repeatedly fidgeting with something. We might really like um, kind of like bright lights or um, really spicy flavors of food. So we might, we might seek sensory, we might avoid sensory, we might do a combination of both. We also might have extreme anxiety, we might have shutdowns and meltdowns. So this is, you know, it's more of the negative side. Um, we are, we are likely to have kind of mental health issues. Um, not all autistic people will, um, but we might experience quite intense anxiety, um, quite intense depression as well. Um, I know I've experienced some kind of mental health difficulties in the past. Um, and, and that was prior to me being diagnosed as being autistic. Um, and so that can be the case for some people. They might experience mental health difficulties and then later on the line re realize, um, oh, oh, actually, this and this and this, and this from my childhood and this mental health difficulty, ah, maybe I'm autistic. They do a bit of research and then it turns out that they are. Um, the same kind of negative situation when it comes to shutdowns and meltdowns. So these two terms, they essentially describe when someone is completely overwhelmed by what's going on around them and also probably what's in their head as well. So it might be we're completely overwhelmed by noises in our environment, so going back to sensory things. It might be that we're completely overwhelmed by people in our environment. And of course, people make noises and do things and they're visual as well. So that can all be overwhelming. Uh, or it could be a combination of the two. Um, and it's almost like fight or flight. So we will shut down, which is like a computer. We will kind of, kind of, shut down and like where we might be verbal or hyperverbal. So I would say I could be quite hyperverbal sometimes, particularly in presentations. We might be hyperverbal, but then when we go into a shutdown, we lose that ability to be verbal. Um, so I've, I've had this before. 
uh, where, and I live on my own in a flat, but I've had this where um, I have a device in my corner, uh, a home speaker device, and it sounds crazy, but I didn't even want to speak to that. I didn't want to speak to that device, uh, which is strange to a bit to a big group of people, but um, I, it was like I didn't want to engage in anything in, in terms of the verbal aspect, like I was probably on my phone, but I just did not want to engage. I was shut down. You can then have a, um, well, not then, but you can have another experience where you're completely overwhelmed, which is a meltdown. I mean, I'm, I hope people wouldn't have a shutdown followed by a meltdown because that would be hugely distressing. It might happen. A meltdown is can be quite physical and it can involve people might um, shout, they might cry, they might thrash their limbs about and it can be hugely distressing. So too can a shutdown. Um, and with a meltdown, it can also be really distressing to the people around that person as well. Arguably most distressing to the person, but to people around them, it can be um, can be really difficult to see, uh, particularly if it's someone that you love um, kind of in that really intense situation. Uh, that is a response to overwhelm. So how, what might we be like in kind of boot camp environments, workplace environments, just the world? Um, and this is focusing on adults because, um, you know, we're all adults on this call. And so I think it's relevant. Um, and and we, don't, we don't grow out of autism. We are autistic till the day we die. So that's okay. Um, you know, it just, it is who we are as people. Um, so we might ask lots of questions. You might have seen this on kind of, if you've been on video calls um, and you've got one person that's maybe asking a lot of questions. They might not be autistic. You know, don't get me wrong. Not everyone who is gonna ask lots of questions is gonna be autistic. We might be really intense and we might not know when to stop. Um, or we might ask no questions at all and then just suffer in silence in the background going, oh God, I don't wanna put a virtual hand up. Oh, I don't wanna do that. Oh, I just won't ask. Oh, and then like, you know, oh God, then I can't hand in this piece of work because I don't understand that. But I won't say, oh, I won't say. And then you, you can see what that can lead to big issues um, in a learning context and in a workplace context. We might work at odd times of the day. We might be, you know, almost night for day and day for night sometimes if things can get, if things get really intense in that area. Um, but you might receive messages from us at kind of one o'clock in the morning. Um, that maybe are from when we're doing really productive work, um, but they might not be the same schedules that people who aren't autistic are on. We might really blend in and try and um, fit in with our peers. Um, so uh, we might try and engage in things that we know other people like, um, or try and like, I don't know, for example, we might try and go, we might force ourselves to go along to a party, even though we know every time we've been to one, um, and we don't really enjoy it. We much prefer, I don't know, going in a trio to the pub or something. Um, but we want to fit in. Or we might really make ourselves known and really be, again, like I was saying before, kind of maybe a bit kind of intense, a bit kind of like in your face. Um, and yeah, that can be perceived, be perceived in different ways by different people. And like I said, we can be grating or annoying. I will, I, I mentioned this in most of the presentations that I kind of create myself um, because yeah, we might be, and we also are humans at the end of the day. Um, and we might struggle in silence. Um, like I was saying earlier with that example of not asking any questions. We might be that kid at the back of a classroom or the adult in a boot camp, or the employee on an away day. Where we're just kind of sitting there going, I don't, I don't get this. I don't, oh, okay. And you just kind of sit there and you can see where that can lead to big problems. Equally, we are, like I said, just like other humans and we will have added layers to us. So English might not be our, our, our um, you know, kind of first language, we might have English as a second language. We might not live in the UK. We might live in a country where autism um, is understood to an extent, but, um, maybe it's not maybe there's more to be done i mean there is there's more to be done globally but that includes every country um we might have complex family lives we might have other um people in our families who are autistic we might have parents who are autistic um and we will have relationships we'll have deep and complex relationships with both autistic peers and peers who are not autistic so we're very complex then Add the tech sector into the mix. Oh, 
we, as I said earlier, we can really excel in terms of our brains when it comes to tech roles. But here's the thing, there are some weird things about tech. And like I said, I've only, so I joined Code Bar a year ago and that was my first that was my first outing into kind of tech. That was, you know, I, I give credit to Copa for kind of helping me into the tech sector. Um, when I properly got into tech and I started doing, you know, boot camps and also um, I did a MOOC course with Code First Girls uh, on Agile and Scrum and like learning about that, for example, um, those kind of methodologies and that way of working. I've, I like one that comes to mind and one which I've talk to um I, I i've spoken to a kind of organization about this i find it really interesting it's around stand-ups so stand-ups are these like daily meetings that people have if they're working in a kind of scrum environment where you basically um you don't always physically stand up so you might be sitting at a desk you know you might be you know it's not an actual stand up but can be what i understand um and you have to kind of talk on the spot about kind of where you are and what your blockers are. Um, and I do know of an organization who actually does them uh, written, not necessarily across the whole organization, but it was a particular team, which is really cool. Like that's something that comes to mind, you know, it, does the organization do verbal standups or written standups? Are written gonna potentially be better for autistic people? Not only because some autistic people might not want to kind of raise their voice, put their virtual hand up, but again, because we might speak and talk quite a lot. So we might need a kind of compact way to put across what we're going to say so that we don't take over the whole meeting. Because we could be, you know, we could be really intense or really quiet somewhere in the middle. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Also pair programming. Um, I really like pair programming. I did a lot of it on uh, the boot camp that I was on. Um, but for some people, probably quite intense particularly if you're in person the concept of having someone looking over your shoulder you know it's like the classic thing of like as soon as someone's looking at you when you're typing your typing goes all over the place and you're like I can't I can't use my fingers and then you just yeah you know, just really bad um but you know if you're like you've got a deadline and you've been told you've got to pair program this specific uh issue on this ticket that you're working on and you might be thinking to yourself like I know this is gonna this is gonna cause a bug this is gonna Ah, I can see, ah. but maybe you don't want to speak up because you're trying to think about other things. You're trying not to, I don't know, like some of keeping up with enforced systems. So you've already heard this, but on Google Images, the little Google of agile uh, memes. And one of them that came up, this is in preparation for the presentation, by the way, not just because I was doing that in my spare time, but I went on there and there was one that was basically like, it was something like, 80% of time updating JIRA, 20% of time actually doing the work. And it's that concept of like, if you get a system put on you as like a, this is how you work, you will work like this, but then you actually just do the work and you ignore the system. And then you're like, oh God, my line manager wants me to update this and to make sure all these tickets are moved. And then you spend ages just doing the admin of it. Like, is there, is there some kind of way that it could be flexible somehow for certain colleagues? And obviously that could, that might not be the case, but it's something that again came to mind, you know, if you're working in a, a kind of agile way, is the autistic person trying to really squash themselves into that system? And is that not actually as efficient for them? And are they maybe less productive because they're kind of being kind of squashed into that system? Um, because that's the thing with this as well. It's not just and understanding autistic people, that is the number one thing. But also it does, you know, involve productivity and it does involve um, the well-being of all colleagues in an organisation, because if autistic people are supported, um, then it will hopefully lead to kind of good productivity all round, hopefully less conflicts, hopefully less kind of workplace uh, sickness and absence. So you can see how it can be helpful to learn a bit about autism. Working, it can be really, really excellent. So you can really be in your own little bubble and just be getting on with your own activities, going and having breaks when you need to. But equally, uh, like I was mentioning at the start of this presentation, when I was doing boot camps, that was a real kind of lifeline for me in terms of my well being. It really, really made a difference for me going in person. And so, with some tech employers maybe wanting to do a lot of remote work 
it's something to bear in mind you know is that is that gonna fit with an autistic person's kind of uh needs are they gonna be able to apply for that role um knowing that they're gonna go in and and, and feel supported and feel like they're getting the right amount of socialization um or are they going to avoid those roles and are people going to miss out on on kind of big tech talent because they're only doing that kind of remote remote working hiring so areas to think about in terms of the tech sector um and things that you know i'm i'm still fairly new but combining my knowledge now and my professional knowledge from working in an autism charity, I just, I find it a really, really interesting area. Also, managing code. It's actually quite a, if you don't have the kind of tools to organize it, it can all just feel like a big mess. And then you're just like, oh God, it can be very easy as a neurodivergent person just to be like, oh, this is this is too overwhelming. Or like, oh, it's too much work. Oh, I'll just procrastinate it. Or, oh, I'll just not engage with it. Um, and so these are some tools. This is particularly for VS Code, but I would recommend, I think all of these, the code. Um, some big shout outs, Code Spell Checker, um, because you know, if you're dyslexic and you spell uh, of your labels wrong, you know, your ID or whatever, um, and then it, it doesn't work, which is tough because you know, Microsoft Word and the like has a spell checker. But um, yeah, so I'd recommend that, although caveat that uh, that particular one there is for American English. So you need to download um, different extensions on top of that if you then want to uh, use that for your particular uh, kind of language. Um, also another big shout out to the Peacock extension, which basically adds a nice colored border um, around your VS code, which is not just for show. Like I find it really helpful if I've got two um, kind of projects next to each other and I want to see how I've done something in a previous project because that is a lot of what I was doing when I was learning. I was like, okay, we did a tutorial. Um, what did we do there? If I can have two VS Code winners, but one is like have, um, surrounded by green and one is surrounded by pink, then I know which is which. And it's just little things like that that can be tools that we can use ourselves to like keep our code kind of distinct from the other and also organized things like prettier a really good for formatting your code so that it's just organized and it helps our brains so i'd really recommend those um, again i'm not affiliated to any of these extensions but i do think they're good so thinking now about reasonable adjustments and kind of how to get a bit of support so reasonable adjustments essentially are trying to remove barriers that disabled people might face because of our disability. To try and ensure that we receive the same services as far as possible as people who aren't disabled. So say people who aren't disabled are here, it's just bringing us up to here. It's not raising us above, it's not being like, oh, we've got like better things. It's just like, no, no, it's just, just making sure we're like all equal, which is really good. Um, and so this, this applies to the UK. So this is talking about the Equality Act, um, but I hope, that there's things in other countries that are similar to this. Um, but reasonable adjustments worth bearing in mind, not only if you're being employed, but also if you're getting a job interview, if you are applying for a job, if you're a student on a boot camp. Um, so things like having a permanent desk when there is a kind of a hybrid, not hybrid, but a kind of you know hot desk situation. Um, it's a reasonable ask. Um, you might not be able to get it because of like, I don't know, maybe there aren't enough desks, but it's worth asking. Flexible hours, which luckily I think a lot of us have nowadays in terms of the tech sector. Um, but if they're not there, worth asking. Things like having an under desk treadmill. Um, so in terms of our sensory system, we might really like having that uh, kind of constant movement where it really help us to concentrate. Um, but it has to be considered, like I said, um, you know, they're the reasonable adjustments. Um, and employers and people can only bring them in uh if they're you know things like if they're practical if they're affordable like as long as they don't harm other people so like say if you have a standing desk and you're on a boot camp like it can't be blocking someone behind you because then that's going to harm the other person behind you is kind of learning um bit of a silly example but it's worth bearing in mind if you are if you're autistic or if you're disabled kind of looking into those uh again if you're based in the uk but i hope that there's something similar in other countries 
And then finally, thinking about how you can access support. Um, this is thinking more about if you yourself think that you may be neurodivergent or think that you may be autistic. Uh, Diversita and Sparta Global are two organizations that seem pretty good. Um, I am on Diversita's books. They're basically a uh, kind of recruitment agency uh, for neurodivergent people. Um, and then Sparta Global as well. They kind of bring people on board and then they get people to hire the people they've trained up. Um, so yeah, you can check them out on their website. Also access to work. Um, they can help people uh, when it comes to job interviews, when it comes to being in work. Again, that's UK, but I'd recommend checking that out. And then like I mentioned earlier, the NHS and the National Autistic Society, uh, really reliable information on there. And also a link there to uh, support lines if anyone does want to reach out and get uh, kind of support and help, there is that link there. Um, or you can contact, like I say, you can contact Kim, you can contact myself, um, but in case of urgent help, then do please head to that link there. And brings me to our discussion. I've left it a little bit late for kind of questions, but we've got about six minutes. So hopefully that will allow a reasonable amount of time. The first question is, um, what triggers a meltdown? Mm, it can, it's very unique to the person. So, um, yeah, but, I mean, being real, like my meltdowns will be when I'm in quite intense kind of emotional situations. So I might have had something really intense happen at work. I might be quite emotional, kind of crying. Um, and that can that will be kind of a trigger for me. So maybe something that happened at work. But equally for someone else, it could be, I don't know, like uh, a theatre show they're going to is cancelled or um, there isn't a certain product that they normally buy in Tesco or a supermarket. Um, so it's very, very unique to the individual, I would say. Thank you so much. And the next question, um, you did you did touch on remote working slightly, but um, someone has asked, how can remote working, um, e.g. collaboration tools and pair programming be optimized to better support people with autism? Mm. So, I mean, with a lot of these questions, again, it's going to be hugely unique. I think there's a classic phrase that's like, when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. So it's it's going to come down to that individual team and that individual employee and, and their line manager. But it will be things like, um, I mean, even if you think of examples of like on, on team schools or even on this call, for example, you know, having those options of like, don't have to have cameras on, or maybe there's an understanding that a certain person will only use a chat when it comes to say a stand up or when it comes to even when it comes to pair programming like in the past I've done this was not in terms of tech but I've done something on Google Docs where I was just like you know you're typing things and you're working together and there's not really a need for verbal language that much if at all um, so it's finding those unique ways to support uh, individuals and it's definitely doable oh thank you um, I'm going to try and rush through these questions because I <laughs> you can I'm always aware. send them. You're welcome yeah, to send yeah, them no. to me, and I can yeah. Um, this next one is how should I react when an autistic person experiences a shutdown or a meltdown? Really good question. Yeah, so mm. I would say with um both of them, try not to be if it's in person, try not to be kind of touching them and hugging them or like um because we might really not want the physical contact. Um react in a similar way if it's a meltdown you might want to apply the same techniques as if someone's having a panic attack so maybe um mirroring well not mirroring but kind of um demonstrating kind of calm breathing so like really just in front of them and allowing them space if it's a public environment maybe helping them to get to a quiet space you know maybe people are staring um if it's in person um i mean if it's online and someone's saying i'm having a really difficult time sending across a message perhaps saying um would you like me to help and if they say yes then saying how can I help so being led by the person um it's going to be similar things to kind of mental health kind of crises and panic attacks but one particular thing is around you know try not to kind of touch the person and get in their personal space um yeah I think that helps yeah um oh someone's asked should a candidate talk about their autism and potential adjustments during an interview if they feel comfortable then they can there, there's normally that box on a kind of a job application where you can put in 
uh, kind of request for reasonable adjustments, or they should be, you know, that's a sign of a good company, I would say, if they've got that in terms of their hiring practices. Um, it can be really useful to disclose. And again, when it comes to starting off and being a new employee, it can be useful to disclose um, because then, you know, you might be able to get an occupational health assessment. Uh, you might be able to have, um, you know, have these kind of open conversations about reasonable adjustments. So it's a very personal decision. Um, but nowadays I do personally disclose. Um, the last question, sorry if we've missed, I know there's a few questions coming in and I know we're not going to reach any of them, but the last one is, how do we approach situations of conflicting needs between autistic people? Oh, between autistic people. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I different mean, needs. Yeah, but equally, we'll, I mean, there'll be different needs as well from the non-autistic people too. So I think, yeah, the how would you address them? <sighs> Speaking to both individuals separately so that they've got privacy to say, perhaps I struggle with how this person reacts or how this, what the kind of things that this person gets. Um, and then if it is a conflict situation, kind of bringing in conflict management and kind of conflict resolution techniques, I'm no expert in those, but, you know, as you would with any other person um, and working out thinking creatively. So if you're in a shared office, is there a particular nook that's like facing lots of walls that one person can have? Can another person have access to like a window so they can look out and have space, kind of Zen mental kind of space? Um, yeah, be creative and it can be hard, um, but I think creativity and respecting both of the individuals, all of the individuals involved. Thank you, everyone. And feel free, uh, my links are up on there if you want to reach out. And you can ask me the same questions. If they didn't get covered in the session, feel free to send them across.